Good morning. Would you stand and worship the Lord with us this morning? Thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together in your name freely, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity we have to come and praise you. Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts and minds this morning to hear what you have for us. And that, Lord, you would come and inhabit our praise this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope. You won't 
Good morning. Welcome to Crossview Missional Church. It's exciting to get together with God's people because we get a chance to see what God's doing in our lives and in our church. We're going to see some of that today. So praise God. Glad you're here. Turn around and greet one another. Little guys, Children's Church is on. It's on our, our fifth in our series, uh, our journey series, which is coming from the Psalms of the Ascension, the Songs of Ascension, depending on your Bible, what they're referred to as. But it's this little collection of Psalms from uh, Psalm 120 through one, Psalm 134, and that, that it, it is a, is written, uh, it was written for the purpose of the Hebrew pilgrims as they, as they made their way from their homes to Jerusalem for the various festivals. There were generally three festivals that they would do that each year, and these songs, songs or psalms uh, were written in conjunction with that. And so the, the, the uh, pilgrims, would, would, this would be their, their road trip music. This would be what they proclaimed, the truth that they sang as they traveled from their home to, to Jerusalem. And so we've, we've looked at that. We've gone through the first uh, four of those, and today we arrive at number five. Last week we looked at the importance of prayer in, the, in, the, uh, in our journey, our journey of faith. That, that the, the critical part that prayer plays, and when we looked at it last week in Psalm 123, he, he, he speaks, he cries out to, to, the, to God who sits on his throne in heaven. It's prayer is what we would refer to that as. And then he begins uh, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, wait on God's answer. He, he, he lays his request before God, but he doesn't simply just dump it at God's feet and walk away. It, it, it indicates this, and now I'm going to stand back as a servant watches the master's hand. I'm going to stand back and I'm going to watch God and I and wait for you to tell me what to do next. And so his prayer isn't simply asking something of God. His prayer is to ask something of God and then to stand back and wait and see how it is that God would want him to respond in this situation. How would God want him to bring about an answer to the prayer? And so, so many times our, our prayer time just simply dumps our, our, our requests at God's feet with no thoughts or indication of how we might be able to respond in that situation. And so the psalmist says, that I, I make this request to God who sits on his throne, and now I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch and wait. And he says, and I'm going to wait for this. I'm going to wait for your mercy. And so his request ultimately is for God's mercy. God, you answer this however you would want, but I want to see your mercy. Now, it really fits in so perfectly with where we are this week as we arrive at Psalm 124. Because now we, we have this, this indication of somebody who's waiting and, and hasn't seen the response. And, and, uh, and I think it's something that we can all uh, pretty much identify with. We have a need in our life and we ask God. We believe confidently that God's going to respond to that. And yet we don't see anything. We, we don't see any response, at least not in our, our time. And so we, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're patient, just as the, the psalmist was in Psalm 123. Now I'm going to patiently wait on you, and yet our, our patience begins to wear out because I'm not seeing a response. I'm not seeing anything. And, and so what we see is, is God's timing is not our timing. We, we have a, an idea of how we want to see this work out, how we want to see this unfold, and oftentimes it isn't exactly like that. And even if it is exactly like that, it's not in that same time frame. And so I ask, and I wait patiently, and yet I'm not seeing anything. I'm not seeing God's response. And so as we look at Psalm 124, it even indicates that somebody who's in trouble, somebody who's sinking, somebody who's about ready to be overwhelmed by the flood, the wave, and, and yet I'm patiently waiting for God's response in this. And so what we're going to look at today is the, the timing of God when it comes to our requests and our prayers. God's timing isn't the same as ours. And so let's take a look at Psalm 124. Uh, and there's only eight verses in, in this, this psalm. But Psalm 124, beginning at, at verse 1. Joel, Joel's, uh, Joel has been thrown to, in the fire today. This is his first time on the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
on, on the, the presentation software. Psalm 124, verse 1 says, If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side, he starts hypothetically speaking, if I would be in this situation, if, if God would not have been with me, is what he's saying. Now, I think that's really kind of interesting because we all, we could finish our own psalm here, couldn't we? We could all take this and say, yes, I know exactly. If God had not been with me, I would be in jail today. I don't know. You know, fill in the blank. It, we, we all have our, our testimony and we all have that idea that we understand that if God wouldn't have been with me in a particular situation, I don't even want to think about it. I don't even want to consider what might have come out of that situation. The choices that I made, if, if God wouldn't have been with me, where I would have ended up. And so we, we can uh, certainly uh, identify with those, those first words. If God had not been with me. And so in this text, we see he recognizes, the psalmist recognizes and understands God has been with him. He's just saying, if it wasn't for him, if he wouldn't be there, I don't know what would have happened. Verse 2 then says, if the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us. And so he's, he's, we're back on that journey. We're back on that, that, that moving from here to there. And in the middle of getting, we, we were attacked. Now, we understand that maybe in a, a personal sense. We, we, we struggle with relationships. And, and so we know what it means to be attacked in that sense. But we also understand what it means to be attacked by our ultimate enemy, Satan, that the fact that we're saved doesn't mean that we are now free from attacks. In fact, we understand that it's even more intense as we come, become believers. There's a, a quote on your paper from C.S. Lewis. The enemy will not see you vanish into God's company without an effort to reclaim you. You'd think, you'd think that I'm, I'm safe and secure, saved by God. And, yet, and now the enemy's going to let me alone. And that, that isn't the way it works. And we need to understand that. The enemy attacks us and the enemy will, be, will continue to a, attack us. Verse 3 says, When their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. This is what would have happened, he says. I would have been swallowed alive. I would have been vanquished. I would have been defeated. If not, go back to the first verse, if God was not with us, if he was not with us, I would have been swallowed. I couldn't have stood in this situation. Verse 4. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. Now notice, there is a flood. It's not that a flood doesn't exist. It's not that God prevented a flood. The flood just didn't overwhelm us. And so this, this attack, this, this situation that is unmanageable by me, it would have completely defeated me except for this one thing. God, and the psalmist recognizes that, that if it was not for God, if God was not here, this situation in my life would have overwhelmed me. It would have taken me down. Verse 5, the raging waters would have swept us away. All hypotheticals, and this would have been what would have happened if not for God in my life. Verse 6, praise be to the Lord who has not let us to be torn by their teeth. And so now he brings the credit, he begins to credit the, 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 the individual whose credit, who deserves the credit, it's God. He recognizes the reason that I was not torn apart, the reason that I was not overwhelmed, the reason that I was not swept away, God. That is the only answer I have in this situation I'm in. Verse 7. We have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. And so the picture there is that the individual, the, 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 the uh, Hebrew who has, been, uh, who has been delivered by God was actually in the trap. It's not that we avoided the trap. It is that we were in the trap and yet we somehow got out of that. We somehow miraculously made our way out of that. The, the fowler, the, there would be that, that, that person who would uh, trap birds and they have elaborate net systems. And, and once the bird was in that, it was, it was pretty much over. And he's saying, we escaped from that. God delivered us from that. I was in the trap 
and God delivered me from it. Verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we see that we're going to look at today this from the perspective of the understanding of God's timing. And, and I want us to, to look at a couple things here and begin with this, is that some of the greatest victories that we experience, we never realized we were on the battlefield. Some of your, 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 the greatest victories you've ever had in your life, the battle never occurred to you because of God. He says, if it wouldn't have been for God, this is what would have happened. And so uh, even though we can get really despondent about how things have played out and how things have worked out in our life and the way things are gone, we need to recognize this. If it wasn't for God, and the psalmist recognizes that, he, he understands that the situation that I find myself in, which isn't optimum, isn't exactly where I want to be, would be a lot worse if it was not for God. And so we need to, uh, to, to understand that when we, when we evaluate our life and we think about where's God in the toils and the troubles of life? Why hasn't God delivered me from this? Understanding this, but, but for God, but for God, we would find ourselves in a much worse, difficult situation. And so some of the, the greatest victories that we experience, we never even realized we were on the battlefield because God was fighting for us before we ever got to that point. And so some of the greatest testimonies that maybe we have are the things that we didn't face. You know, there's this idea that a really good testimony, a really good testimony is one that, that somebody was delivered from a, a sordid past. They look back at the, 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 the pain and the misery of their life and they see that God has delivered them. And man, that is a powerful testimony, isn't it? We, we like those kind of testimonies. We like to hear how God took somebody who was mired in drug abuse and, 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 and all kinds of messed up problems in their life, and then they were delivered from that. And man, that makes a powerful testimony. And I, I agree with that. I believe that. But we need to understand this, that sometimes the most powerful testimony is the fact that I never got to that place. The fact that I never ended up there is a powerful testimony. The fact that God delivered me from that which I never stepped into is a great testimony of what God has done. And we should not be like trying to like beef up our testimony just because it's not impressive enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little, you know, I'm going to embellish it a little bit so it impresses you. So it becomes more powerful, and more effective. Your testimony is your testimony. And, and if you, if you weren't, if you didn't go through years of drug abuse and sexual addiction and, and, and all kinds of messed up things in your life, that's, that's an awesome testimony. That's something that God deserves praise for. Not just because you weren't delivered from some messed up life doesn't mean your testimony isn't powerful. And so he says, but for God, if it was not for God, I remember going for years, we would go over to the, the youth forestry camp at Shroff Creek. We go over there and sit with the kids at Christmas time and sometimes at Easter. And I'd sit and talk with those kids. And something that really struck me was the difference between me and them was very negligible. The, the, who I was at 17 years of age compared to who they were at 17 years of age wasn't really that different. We did some of the same things. They got caught. There were, there, were, there were things in my life that was very similar to things in their life. And it just turned out that, that many of them were in situations that, that led downhill and ended up, they ended up sitting in a youth detention center. And I, and I didn't. And so I look back at that and I can, I can say that. I can say, but for God. If it wasn't for God, that's where I would have been too. I would have been swallowed up into that. And so as we consider, uh, evaluate, think about what God has done in our lives. Be thankful for the protection that you never experienced, things that you very well could have experienced, that, that you, you, but for the grace of God, would have been in that same place. And the psalmist seems to echo that in this. And so, I will look at the situation here, though, as we, as we, we begin with this point, and it is that God's deliverance is sometimes before we recognize the peril. 
Sometimes God delivers us before we even see that we're in the mess we're in. We don't see the danger. We don't recognize we're surrounded. So as that Hebrew was traveling on the dangerous roads from, from their home to Jerusalem, sometimes the danger was apparent. They could see it around them. Sometimes the danger was in the hills and they couldn't see it. Doesn't make it any less dangerous. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean you're not in a dangerous situation. And so as, as followers of Christ, as Christians, we, we, we recognize that, we understand that. Sometimes the danger is apparent to us. Sometimes we can see it. Sometimes we have been delivered from it before we ever knew that it existed. And so as we try to understand God's timing in response to things in our life, we need to begin with that. God's deliverance is sometimes before we recognize the peril. In this situation, the text that we looked at, peril exists. They are in a bad situation. They find themselves in a difficult situation. Now, could God have prevented this from ever happening? Could he have could he prevented them from being in a frightening and dangerous situation? Certainly could, but he didn't. And we're going to look at that. Why not? Wouldn't it be better if God just shielded us? If God, when I gave my life to Christ, he put this force field around me. And, and that is going to prevent any attacks, any dangerous situation I might come on. But the psalmist says, it's, it's a flood. They're attacking me. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Or I would have been, except for God. And so God, why would, why does God allow me to get into the mess why, why does he allow, why doesn't he just prevent it? Because his timing is not the same as ours. And so the second point is this, that God's deliverance is sometimes in the middle of peril. Sometimes we are overwhelmed. Sometimes we see the attack. We see the enemy. We see the danger that we are, of the, of the situation that we find ourselves in. And oftentimes, that's when now, that's when our prayer becomes most earnest, right? That's when we really get serious about it. Because now I see the enemy. I, I recognize the danger that I find myself in. And so sometimes God deliverance is in that, which is how the psalmist really describes it. I would have been, there's a flood. There is a flood, but I'm not overwhelmed. There's an attack, but I'm not killed. There, there is danger evident. There is danger present, but regardless, in the middle of that, I know this, in the middle of my peril, God delivers. God pulls me out of that. And so when, when we went just through our, our prayer time, we are generally speaking about people who are in the middle of peril. People who find themselves in, in, a, in a hard, painful, difficult situation. And so, so God says to them, through the psalmist, he says, if it, if it wasn't for God, I would have been overwhelmed. I would have been, the flood would have taken me down. I would have been destroyed. And so God's deliverance is sometimes before we recognize the peril, but sometimes it is in the middle of the peril. And so what's the deal? Why, why, is, why is God so seemingly inconsistent in this area? Why does he prevent me from facing problems sometimes? Why does he allow me? Because God is sovereign. God, God can do what God wants to do. Why does he sometimes allow this to come into my life? Why do I find myself? Now, granted, some of that is my own doing. But, but why, does, why does sometimes am I almost overwhelmed and then God delivers me? Well, here's what we need to if, if you don't have anything else, if you don't walk away with anything else, walk away with this today. God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. God is going to deliver you in the timing that is perfect in his perspective. And we are going to look at why that is. What, what, why, would he, why would he sometimes allow the water to come up to here? And why sometimes does it, not even get to my ankles. Why, why is it sometimes it seems like, God, I'm, 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 I'm going under, and sometimes it's like he just lifted me up and I never experienced, I, I didn't even know that it existed. We're going to look at this psalm here and, and, and maybe, I think, have some 
better understanding of it. The first reason is this. God's timing of deliverance demonstrates the believer's insufficiency. God's timing of deliverance demonstrates the believer's insufficiency. If I didn't find myself in a difficult situation that was beyond my ability to lift myself out of, I would always attempt to lift myself out. If, if everything that I did, every time that any kind of little need came up in my life that I did not experience insufficiency, if I thought that I could handle it, I would handle it, or I would try to handle it. And that, that I mean, think about it. Isn't that the way we deal with God? We have those things that we are capable of, things that I can handle that I keep over here, and I, I'll take care of those things. And then there are those things that I can't. Okay, Cancer in my life, so I, a, a loss of a loved one. Okay, that's stuff I can't handle. I can't handle that on my own. So that's God's stuff, and this is my stuff. When in truth, what we need to understand, it's all God's stuff. And so if I never feel insufficient, I will always be sufficient in my own. I will always depend on myself. And so why would God allow me to almost sink? Why would he allow me to almost be overwhelmed by the flood? Because I need to understand that I can't do this stuff on my own. I need to recognize my insufficiency. I'm not capable of handling everything that comes into my life. And you are not capable of handling everything that comes into your life. And so sometimes God needs to show, demonstrate to us that you are insufficient. You don't have the skill and the talent and the ability to handle this. You know, as a preacher, as a preacher, some of the, the, the best lessons I learn, and, and, but the, some of those hardest are in my insufficiency. When you get comfortable and I think I can handle this and I think I can do this, I can, oh, I can throw together a message. I can, I can preach like the best of them. And, I, and, then, and then, I, then I end up saying and looking, uh, uh, preaching a message that seems really not that good. And it's like, I need that. I need to be reminded of my insufficiency. That the fact that how much I need God in every aspect of my life. And if I never get to that point, I will remain self-sufficient. I will remain thinking that I've got the skill, I've got the ability, I can handle this. And yet, the psalmist finds themselves insufficient. They can't depend on self-sufficiency. And so, in that, they cry out to God. The next thing I think that we see in this is that God's timing of deliverance leads the believer to trust. In our insufficiency, we have this option, trust. When I get to a point where I can't handle it, when I recognize that it is beyond my ability, I, got, I, I, I can either pack it in, quit, I can kind of fake it, I can try harder, or I can just simply trust in God. I'm going to trust that God's going to carry me. And so as the psalmist sees the enemy on the horizon, or, or is experiencing the flood where they're just about to go under, it, it is at, at that moment that we really begin to trust I'll go back to that. As long as we're self-sufficient, we don't have a need to trust. We don't really see a, a need to, to depend on God for anything. I'm going to depend on God for my salvation and nothing more. And yet when I find myself in a, in a situation that's beyond my ability to handle, I don't have a whole lot of choices. I, I just have, I have to trust God. And so we see that in people's lives as they face tragedy and difficulties. They might have spent most of their life being totally self-sufficient, but in those moments when tragedy and pain and sickness and loss comes into our life, then we don't have any other choice. I just have to, to trust God in, in that situation. It is important for Israel to understand the magnitude of, of the danger in order to understand their need to trust God. If they don't understand how serious the situation is, then they don't need God. They don't trust God. I can fight this battle on my own. 
And, and the same thing is true for us. If we never recognize how, how perilous the situation we are, that we are in, we aren't going to trust in God. As we, as we uh, fiddle around and, and, and mess around in, in areas of our life that are, we're teetering on the edge of disobedience, which is disobedience, but, but when we're messing around with sin and kind of uh, trying to, to keep it at a safe distance, which there is no safe distance, but, but when, when we do that, we don't recognize the magnitude of our sin. We don't recognize the magnitude of the danger. We think that we're keeping it safe, yet there is no safe place. I just told a story years ago. We went to the beach with the girls, and, and they, were, they were just little. And we got there the first day, and they're all excited, and we're heading off, to the, heading off down to the water. And, and a, a little crab ran across the road in front of us. And, of course, the girls are all excited, and they're going over to look at the crab. And I thought I'd be cool dad, you know. I'd show them how you handle crab. So I bent down and I scooped the crab up in my hand. And the girls were like, Dad, what are you doing? That crab's going to bite you. And I said, no, you just got to know how to handle crab. So I'm holding the crab in my hand and it starts to run. It starts to run, runs right out of my hand, falls to the ground. And, and, and so, I, I, and so I, I had a chance. God opened the door. God always gives a way of escape, right? <laughs> And so I, I bent down and I scooped it up again in my hand. And, and they're like, Dad, he's going to bite you. Finally, the, the crab's patience with me had worn out. And he grabbed the hold of the end of my finger. I mean, like a vice on the end of my finger. It's just like, you can't even imagine a little creature like that could put that kind of, that kind of pressure. But he grabbed the hold of the end of my finger. I started yelling. And the girls are like, they know me. They're like, Dad. <laughs> they think I'm messing with them. Okay, I start doing this. I start going like this. And the crab is hanging on the end of my finger. And finally, he flies off. Flies off my finger. His, his, his claw is still on my finger. <laughs> the crab flies. <laughs> lands on the ground. And the girls immediately go to the crab. They're like, <laughs> I lost his claw. There's a... They, they could care less. But, but my, my foolishness was this. I, I thought that I could keep it at a, a safe distance. I thought there was a way that I could handle it without experiencing the pain from it and, and learned a really hard lesson. It was a great teachable moment for my kids. And, and, but it is, it is true of us when it comes to this, when we're, we're kind of fiddling around, messing with sin. We don't understand the magnitude of the danger. We don't recognize the peril of, of, of keeping it at what we think is a safe distance. And so sometimes we find ourselves in, I believe, really perilous situations so that we understand that. That we understand the danger. And in understanding the danger, understanding the need to trust. The need to, to depend on God in that particular area of our life. And so what happens as a result of this? I love the Psalms, and, and, and there's so many times they work this way. It starts out with somebody crying out in fear and pain and problems. And but by the time they work through eight verses, by the time they, they, they filter down through that and they get to the end, what almost always happens is God is praised. And in this, it, the same thing happens. He begins, if it wasn't for God, I'd have been swept away. This would have been awful. And then it always ends up with God receiving praise. They begin to praise God is what the text says in, in verse 6. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. He recognizes that the reason that i am been delivered from this is God. And I'm going to give him the credit. It wasn't anything I did, it was God. And so we praise God as a result of that. As we come here on Sunday morning, and we, we refer to the, the time of music as praise, praise and worship, and, 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 I, and I hope it is. I hope as you, as you sing those songs that you are truly reflecting your heart in response to what God has done in your life this week, or what God has done in your life 
in general, as, as a whole. But we are, we are crediting God for what he has done. And if we never get to that point of danger, if we never get to that point of, of, of pain and, and almost overwhelmed, then we are unlikely, less likely to praise. But when, we, when God doesn't respond right away, and we think he's absent, and yet it's his timing, and when his timing comes in its perfect time, then we praise him. We, that results in praise. And so God's timing of deliverance leads the believer to praise. And then finally, we go back to the first verse. The first verse says, If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say. He's saying, I want you to tell this story. I want you to, to tell people that if God would not have been on your side, tell them what would have happened. You know, when we look at our own life and we look at it and, and we've got 75 different stories here. But your story is your story. And it's a story where God pulled you out of the flood or, or pulled you out before the flood began. But, but in some way, God has delivered you from ultimately hell. But delivered you in, in more uh, worldly ways also. But God has delivered you. That's your story. And he says, if God had not been on our side, let Israel say. This is the testimony of Israel. And I, and I believe that it is our testimony too. That when we look back on our life and we reflect on good choices, bad choices, great situations, not so great situations, things that we wished we could erase from our past, all of that is part of our story and how God has delivered us. God has lifted us from the flood instead of being overwhelmed. And, it, and it's our responsibility to tell that story. I can't tell your story any more than you can tell my story. It, it is yours personally. And, and so for us as believers, as Christians, we go through difficult times. God isn't right there, it seems like, when we would want him to be. And I don't mean to say that he isn't there, but, but we, would, we would perceive that he wasn't there. He didn't answer right when I asked. He didn't change the situation right when I wanted. But it's all part of your story. And it should result in you telling that story to other people. It presents an opportunity for you to share who God is and what God has done in your life. How you, like the psalmist, were attacked. You, like the psalmist, were ready to be swallowed up by the flood. You, you like the psalmist, found yourself in that snare, trapped. And yet God delivered you from that. The God's deliverance leads the believer to tell others. We have been each given a story that we need to be able to tell. We need to, to be able to, to practically think through and, and relate to other people. To tell people, here's my story. Here's what God did in my life. This, this is how I am where I am today. You know, one of the most powerful means of sharing the gospel is our own story. It's the, it's the practical demonstration of what the gospel looks like when it touches somebody's life. There's the gospel... There's the gospel, the good news of the gospel, but then there's the gospel as it affected you and how it saved you, how it changed your life. And so as believers, I, I believe that God's timing is perfect in the sense that it's going to lead us to share a story that is going to be profound, a story that's going to resonate with people, a story that's going to affect people. And so as we continue our journey of faith this week, I want to encourage you to, to, to think this week in your devotion time about your story. Think about if God, if, if not for God, where would I be? And, and, and make that a part of your life that you can comfortably share that with other people. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you, God, that you did deliver us. Lord, in a, in, a, in a certain sense, we were all at one time ready to be swallowed up. Swallowed up by hell. And yet you delivered us. 
like the bird from the fowler's net you delivered us. Help us, Lord, to recognize that. That we are not in this privileged place of salvation because of our goodness, because of anything we have done. But for you, but for God. If it weren't for God, we thank you for that today, Lord. Bless us as we close this time together. And Lord, help us to, to recognize and see the, the story that you're writing in our life. Help us, Lord, to faithfully share that with others. We thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? your affections are for me and oh Thank you, Lord, that you have 
uh, reach down into the situation that we have found ourselves in, Lord, hopeless and helpless. And God, you've delivered us. You've lifted us from that. I pray, Lord, that as we walk out of here and we enter into the daily uh, routines of life and we, and we walk back into the pains and the struggles and the difficulties that we face, that we understand this, God, that you will deliver us, that your timing is perfect. And, and Lord, we trust in that. We trust in you. Bless your people as we go. And Lord, help us all to tell the story, the story that you've written on our hearts. We thank you and we pray these things all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.